Let's talk about the stimulus package, and then we'll talk about kind of what to do when you're in self-isolation. Stimulus package, two billion, two, sorry, billion, I wish, two billion. Two billion is like chump change for these guys. Two trillion dollars, just to give you a sense of what two trillion dollars is. Well, no, this will not give you a sense of what it is. Just to give you, you know, it's a thousand billion. Richest man in the world is worth about a hundred billion. This is... 20 times the entire worth of Jeff Bezos. Um, a billion, of course, is a thousand million. So this is two million millions. I don't know if that means anything to any of you. But how many of you have a million dollars? Imagine having two million times that amount. That is... Is that right? That is, yes, that is two trillion. Two trillion. The entire budget of the United States is about four and a half trillion. So this is almost fifty percent of the of the entire budget. The deficit this year for the uh, government budget was one trillion dollars. This will triple the deficit, triple the deficit immediately, pretty much. Um, you know, we have something like 20-something, 20 23, $24 trillion of debt. This will take us to $25 trillion of debt. I, you know, nobody seems to care. Right? Uh, and so it's, first of all, it's a lot of money, a lot of money, a lot of taxpayer money are now going to be funneled. Well, not taxpayer money because they're going to borrow this. Or oh, really what they're going to do is they're going to print this. Because remember, the Federal Reserve is committed to, what do you call it, uh, um, QE, infinite, to buying up as much government debt as necessary. So imagine a situation, which is very realistic, where basically they print $2 trillion. So we're talking about $2 trillion dollars printed, and then distributed into the economy. Now, I've said often that if you're going to do something like this, if you're going to do something like this, then hand everybody a check. Take the entire U.S. population, divide it by two trillion and whatever's left, divvy it up in money. Give it, give it to individuals and let individuals make investment consumption Decisions based on their personal values. Now, but of course, that's not what they're going to do. They're going to take a small portion of this because why is that not a good idea? Why, why is the last thing politicians want to do is actually write you and me a check? Why wouldn't they just take the $2 trillion and give it to us and let us spend it if they're going to distribute the $2 trillion anyway? What, what do you think is preventing from, from doing that? Well, it's obvious. If, if, if they hand us the checks, they don't have any power. They don't have any power. Their power comes from allocating the money. Their power comes from picking winners and losers. Their power comes from deciding who to give the money to and who not to give the money to. For example... Which industries to bail out and which industries not to bail out? One of the sticking points here is $500 billion, a quarter of the package, which is uh, dedicated to corporate bailouts and which uh, Mnuchin, uh, Treasury Secretary, wants absolute power over making those decisions. Now, that is amazing power you're giving him. You're giving this one guy... The ability, I mean, I hope bureaucracy will be created in order to do this, to decide which companies to give the bailouts to and which not. Now, the Democrats say, okay, you can give the money to these corporations. They would never object to that. They're all for cronyism. But they want more control. They want no bonuses for managers, which means the quality of the managers you're going to get is lower. They want no stock buybacks, which means the cash accumulated on these balance sheets will just sit there instead of going back to shareholders who can invest it in a more useful way. I mean, 
you, you might want to limit the borrowing these corporations do at, at a 0% interest rate that the Fed is creating. But stock buybacks are actually healthy if they're not done just with borrowed money. And even, even doing it in borrowed money is only bad in bad times, like right now. So, so they, want, they want caps on CEO pay. They want all this stuff. And again, you cap CEO pay, you reduce bonuses, you get lousy managers. Why would I go and run a company? Who's going to cap my, my bonus? Who's not going to give me a decent salary if I can go to a competitor who's not getting a government bailout and can pay me as much as I'm worth? But nobody disagrees on $500 billion to give government the ability to pick winners and losers. And then there's going to be at least $180 billion, $180 billion dollars to invest in hospitals. Now, I mean, most of these hospitals are private. By the time the money gets deployed, coronavirus will be history. What is this really about? Why are we deploying $180 billion, that's a lot of money, to building new wards in hospitals, creating new beds, doing all this stuff. When, by the way, the only reason hospitals don't have a lot of hospital beds is because their regulations that have told them to shrink the number of hospital beds become more, quote, efficient and charge less to Medicare and Medicaid. So it's government that put us in a position where... We have so few hospital beds. And now government wants to pay the hospitals not to do that. And I think a big part of this paying the hospitals and putting $180 billion of government money into the hospitals is all a scheme to basically, it's one step closer to nationalizing it all. It's one step closer to getting to a single-payer national health care service like the NHS in England, where there are no, or there are very few private hospitals. The private are all owned by the government. Well, if you're now injecting $180 billion dollars into hospitals, then you're probably owning them. And to deal with the coronavirus, I'm not sure you need 180 billion. Sounds like a lot. And it's going to be too late. You should have started investing in hospitals a month and a half ago and selectively focused like New York. And even there, you don't necessarily need permanent new facilities. You need, like what New York is doing right now, field hospitals, taking over abandoned buildings and turning them into temporary hospitals. What you need is the capacity and the ability to create alternative healthcare delivery mechanisms. And you don't need $180 billion to do that. This is basically an attempt to, without saying so, nationalize the hospital system and nationalize the health care system in the United States. And you've got on and on $2 trillion. Who knows what's in this bill? How many people, I, I'll, I'll take bets here. How many people do you think, how many congressmen and senators do you think will actually read the bill before they sign it, before they vote on it? I think almost nothing. Nothing. Nobody will. I mean, who's got the time? This is urgent. We got to get it right now. Right now. Basically, $2 trillion stimulus package is a massive, massive <coughs> government takeover of our economic lives. It is a massive government intervention. It is a massive uh, power grab by Congress and by the White House. It involves the government so much more in every aspect of productive life in America. It's very much like the kind of stimulus packages that we're seeing socialists, so, more socialist countries in terms of government intervention like this, to particularly welfare, like, like Denmark. So, you know, we're heading on the road to 
less and less economic freedom, more and more government intervention, more and more dependence on government. That's the other side of this. That's the other side of this, right? More and more dependence on government. Because all of us are now going to be dependent on government. Because to pay our rents, since they won't let us go to work, to pay our rent, we're going to have to get that check from the government. And if you're a small business and you can't open the business, you're now dependent on those low interest rate loans or grants. Or, right? And the grants, some of the grants might be conditioned. So, for example, the Democrats want to make the, the bailout of the airline industry con contingent on them reducing their carbon emissions by half. Uh, by, I don't know, 2050. And they also want to make the bailout condition on minimum wages. Who knows what Republicans want to condition their bailout on? Uh, Jonathan Honing writes, he who writes the checks makes the rules. Well, if they're writing all of us checks, if they're writing every small business in America check, a check, if they're writing hospitals check, if they're writing airlines checks and cruise lines and a million other businesses. There's even a provision here for businesses that are required for national security. Vague national security. Why? Right now? Is that a th are we a war? Is national security a threat? No, but this is, again, another way to get money in. And, of course, the Republicans are trying to sneak in this bill money for the wall. Democrats are trying to sneak into this bill stronger protection for unions, Minimum wage of $15, all kinds of other things. And we see more and more and more controls. Greater and greater influence of government. And we are on that slippy slide, but we're, we're getting close to the end of it, of that slippy slide to serfdom. The road to serfdom. Um, it's, it's so discouraging to see. And what's discouraging, I think I said this yesterday, what's discouraging about this stimulus package, above all, is when Obama passed the trillion dollar stimulus package, Republicans opposed it. Republicans fought it. Nobody's fighting this right now. They're just fighting over the spoils. They're fighting over who will have more control. They're fighting over who gets to dictate the standards. They're fighting over who gets to divvy up the goodies. So, yeah, the, um, the statists are complete in control. Left and right doesn't matter anymore. They're all statists. And this is what happens when Republicans are governing. When Republicans govern, there is no opposition party. Because on economic issues, they all agree. They all agree. They all want to live off of us. They all want to control our lives. They all want to make us dependent. This is why I've always said a Democratic president, Republican Senate and House, Republicans are not great opposition party, but decent opposition party. That's what I'm advocating for. Um, anything else I want to say about... Uh, notice that all of this is guised as an emergency, the only way to save the economy. An economy the politicians have destroyed, by the way. An economy that is in the shape it is because the Trump administration was so weak and pathetic in its early response. Now we have to bail it out with $2 trillion. And this on top of the trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars that the Federal Reserve has, has said that they will pump into the economy as liquidity as necessary. So on all fronts, a, a government takeover. Now, you know, I hate to, I, I, I find it difficult to be optimistic, but at the end, what this really does and what this really will do is it creates what, it, what the, what the uh, Fed and what the stimulus package did under Obama. You know, uh, Bush had a $300 billion stimulus, Obama a billion. Then the Fed did QE1, QE2, QE3, and then uh, everything else that the Fed did. And what was the result? The result was we came out of the financial crisis with slow economic growth, slow employment growth, 
struggling to, to really grow fast. And for the last 10 years, under Obama and under Trump, the economy has kind of, you know, petered or, you know, barely grown. I know, I know Trump has claimed this is the greatest economy in human history, but it's not. It was growing at 2%. 2% is pathetic. Pathetic. So that's what's in our future. And, and because the stimulus package is bigger, because the Fed is intervening more, because we're further down the road to self, to, to, because we're further on the road to serfdom, um, the, 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 the long-term economic consequences of this are going to be worse. We're looking at 0 to 2% economic growth for the foreseeable future. What we need today, what I call the new intellectual, would be any man or woman who is willing to think. Meaning, any man or woman who knows that man's life must be guided by reason, by the intellect, not by feelings, wishes, whims, or mystic revelations. Any man or woman who values his life and who does not give, want to give in to today's cult of despair, cynicism, and impotence and does not intend to give up the world to the dark ages and to the rule of the collectivist brute. Using the super chat, and I noticed yesterday when I appealed for uh, support for the show, many of you stepped forward and actually uh, supported the show for the first time. So I'll do it again. Maybe we'll get some more today. Um, if you like what you're hearing, if you appreciate what I'm doing, then I appreciate your support. Uh, those of you who don't yet support the show, Please take this opportunity. Go to yourunbrookshow.com slash support or go to subscribestar.com, your own book show, and, um, and, and make a kind of a monthly contribution uh, to, keep this, uh, to keep this going. I'm not sure when the next...